mercy you pulled me in when i had given up you never quit when i couldn't trust you you proved me wrong when i was a stranger you brought me home when i couldn't reach you you pulled me in when i Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are uh, on a road going through Romans. Um, and we just want to throw some announcements out at you before we start. We know a lot of you are far away from this church in Sonora, California. But we do want to say if you are close by and you would like a Bible study, we have one happening on Tuesday uh, from 9 to 10. And I will be leading that. And then we have one on Wednesday from, from 11 o'clock to one o'clock. So you're welcome to come to either one of those uh, Bible studies. The door is open. Actually, the door is not open because we have it outside of the church. But wherever you are, um, welcome again. And we are moving right through Romans. I didn't want to jump off into Matthew, but this is an interesting Sunday because it talks about the government and why governments are established. And one of the things that we can get into our minds is that, well, it's all about uh, the United States government. But remember, when this was written, the United States government did not exist. Actually, when this was written, the people who wrote it did not even know about the North American continent, as we call it today. But there is a purpose that God has put governments in the world from the beginning of time. So he, it, we're, we're going to talk about that today. There's not a whole lot in the Bible about this, in the New Testament, I will say. Um, but this is one of those passages. So the Holy Spirit does speak through the word. So let God make that difference in your life as you spend time with us. We start by getting close to God through confession and absolution, which the strangeness of Christianity, uh, life is not about us obeying rules, but God reaches out to us when we fail at obeying his rules. That no one... Uh, can stand. The Bible says that, O oh Lord, if you kept the record of sins of the Lord, who could stand? And there's no answer there. <laughs> Just it just puts it out. But the answer is nobody. So there's two things that God asks us to do and two things that will make us into failures. And God makes us into success with his love. But stay with me, okay? One is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And number two is to love the people he puts in your life like you love yourself. Now, I say put into your life, but you are, we call it in the New Testament, it's translated as neighbor, but everybody who's close to you. Now, today's age, everybody's close to us, especially through digital. Um, the world is closer than it's ever been. But God is saying to us, he wants us to treat people the same way we treat ourselves. So I would like it to take a moment, we call this the mirror, to see where you've fallen short of the glory of our God's will for your life. And we will speak of his grace and mercy. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter how hard you failed and how hard you went down because of what you've done. God is here today to say to you, the past is forgiven. 
Yes, we can struggle with the past. Not God's will that we would. This is God's will that he calls a pastor to say to people. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christianity is a response to God's grace. So, what can you do in your life to respond to God? It could be basically just saying, God, here am I. I'm going to live my life according to your will. It could be saying to you, um, well, it could be, it does say that we want to live according to the will of God, to say, I want to understand government. I want to understand how you put a curb in this life through government. I want to go beyond government. I want to live according to your will and not according to just what the government would tell me although those things fall into place. I want to forgive as I have been forgiven. I want to love. I want to build up other people with my life. I want to contribute. I want to make the most of my life by being a servant. It's all there for the response to grace, and you've been empowered through the grace of God to do just that. Okay. We have Romans chapter 13. We have Noah here on camera. And uh, Noah, we're going to go ahead and read Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers have hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring a punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not because of possible punishment, only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, or what other, other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Getting at government. That's what we're here to talk about today. If you listened, there is some stuff, stuff, material or tough words to swallow in Romans chapter 13. Uh, and we have to say in the church, um, they've given us problems. That all governments have been established by God. Now, the views of government since the time that this has been written, you know, they tend to fall into two camps. One uh, was called the divine right of kings. And the divine right of kings would take Romans chapter 13 and say, God says, I am in charge. Therefore, as a, as a prince or a king, you need to do what I say. And if you don't do what I say, you're breaking God's command, just as the text is saying. There's another thought that had came along, and I believe the uh, 15th, 16th century, we have a man named Thomas Hobbes. I think he was 17th century. As well as John Locke, who you may have heard of also. And they believed in what was called a social contract. Now, Thomas Hobbes believed that 
you know, you need to obey the king. And why do you need to obey the king? Because um, the problem is, is with people, what he calls the state of nature. And the state of nature basically says that uh, without governments, people will just start beating on one another, taking whatever they want, stealing from one another, and you would have chaos in a society. That's why governments have been uh, created. And even if you have a, tyrannous, a, a, a tyranny or a totalitarian leader, um, a tyrant, a fascist, running, it's better to obey them than the alternative. The alternative for him was often what he saw in his youth was civil war, and he was horrified with what he saw. The suffering and the pain once humans start fighting. Now, Thomas Locke, who also would fall into the social contract. Now, the social contract is not that clear with Thomas Hobbes. But John Locke believed that there are certain inalienable rights that God has given us. And you may have heard this from our founding fathers in the documents and the, of, uh, the Declaration of Independence. That there are certain things that God gave to people. And it is the king, the prince, the government's job to protect those things. Now, that's really... Hmm, let me know what you think in the comments below if... Um, you find any place in the New Testament that we have certain inalienable rights that are given to us by God. Uh, really, I think the New Testament, and challenge me on this one, uh, would say that God owes us nothing, the world owes us nothing, and um, we have what we have only by the grace of God. I mean, there's nothing that you come into life and say, me and my rights. But, but check me out on this one. But what this, where this came from is from the view of nature, looking at nature. And this is where he, the human rights come from. And it's a government's job to protect those things. Now, what does God want us to know? Noah, let's take a shot here. God wants us to know that he establishes government. that they were created by him to control humans from trespassing against each other, from hurting one another. And so he's saying that everyone needs to submit to them because he put them in. Now, this is a problem. And maybe I don't even need to say it's a problem. If you're following close here, you get it. The problem is, how do you deal with the Idi Amin? Um, I asked Noah who that was. He doesn't know. Maybe you don't know either. How about a Paul Pot? Okay, let's get some names in here that you might know. How about a Joseph Stalin? Or the most famous in the 20th century tyrant, Adolf Hitler. Look at the human rights abuses. Look at what um, they did and how they hurt people. Uh, separating families uh, and sending uh, young children with their mothers to the gas chamber. Uh, horrible things. You still even hear out of North Korea, horrible things even going on today. Well, there's always human rights abuses and governments that are abusive. And now we say, God has established those governments. How do you deal with that? I would say, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you something here. I would say if you go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 says God allows uh, the world to be frustrated. And the purpose of allowing it to be frustrated, to let it go. He says this in Romans 1, 2, where he talks about, so God gave them up. Let them go. And to their own devices, they get frustrated. The purpose of the frustrated is not just basically to punish people. Romans 8 says the purpose of frustration is to liberate people, to set them free, which God would give in Christ. Now, there's another problem. I'll go back into history of where this passage has been problematic. The American Revolution. The United States of America, if this is your country, I know some of you may be in Canada. I hope our Canadian friends are with us. But the uh, United States of America was not always the United States of America. This was Great Britain. And uh, the early founding fathers rose up against the 
British and said no. This is the social contract, and you're not fulfilling the social contract, so we're rebelling against you, and then there, voila, we're born. Okay. How do you deal with that? You know, born in sin? The deal is, every government is going to have its problems. Every government is going to have its weaknesses and be a problem. And at the same time, God is saying to us, the government is set up to deal with sin. Now, the world deals with sin in a different way than the way that God deals with sin. Well, God would say also, as he's saying here, that he's the one behind governments. You know, people talk about a Christian nation. Well, I, you don't think you can really say that. Because Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And how does his kingdom work? His kingdom works through grace. You're loved, you're forgiven. How does he govern people? By love and forgiveness. Try to run a nation that way and see how it goes. Christianity is a response to God. To live in response. Now... I continue to learn. Romans is really helping me, but I, I, this is a moment I'd like to know what you think, okay? Could people respond to their government who does them well, who does them good? I think that can happen in the same way that we respond to God who loves and forgives us. I think we've heard this from a lot of immigrants. So <laughs> I'm learning something new. Hey, down below in the comments, let me know what you think. I mean, I just heard someone saying, I want to, uh, this is a Canadian. I want to respond to God, or I want to respond to my nation because it took care of me while I was sick. I want to pay my taxes, is what they were, I gladly want to pay my taxes because of they were there when I needed them most. Uh, hey, there's another question I'd ask. Is, have you ever known anybody who's happy to pay their taxes because their government is doing good things with their money? This is, that's not a United States of America. It's hard to find that, but have you ever heard of it? You know of anybody who's done it. Okay, but Christianity and government are different camps. We call this, if you know these terms, left-hand, right-hand kingdom. Left-hand kingdom being the kingdom of this world, governments, the way God runs the world. Right-hand kingdom is more, uh, is Jesus Christ, who brings in the kingdom of God through love, grace, and forgiveness in the death and resurrection of Christ. Two governments. Okay. Noah, let's take another shot up here. God wants us to know that governments are established to curb sin. Okay? What does this mean? And I think we've already hit on it in point number one. Sin is dealt with through putting up a curb that says don't go beyond this. Don't go beyond this point. Okay? They set up, I almost in a sense like the word fence better. A speed limit is a curb. Any type of government regulation is a curb that's put up. No, let's, we were talking about this before the service. Let's show you one right here. This building is, what, um, 2003, which is 17 years ago. Uh, and what we had to do is we had to build this. See if you can follow me. Follow me, follow me. <laughs> okay. We had to build this right here. This is for ADA, which is disabilities. So if you could not walk, you, you don't need to go up the steps, but rather in a public building, the government says you've got to build this thing that goes up and around for people that cannot manage the steps. And you do not get your building signed up, you, uh, off. You don't get a use, per, a use permit to use the building until all of these government regulations. How many times have we used that ADA ramp? I think 
about none. There was one time I took someone behind the church just to let them check it out. Um, but the government says you've got to do that. That's a curb. The curb actually is you don't get your use permit unless you do what government regulations tell you to do. The purpose of it is to stop us from sinning. Now, if we go back to love your neighbor as yourself, that's what it's about. Is it practical? That's questionable because we'd prefer to use that space in other places. Look, if you've ever had a situation where you go to someone's house, you have a couple glasses of wine, and you think to yourself, you know, I don't know if I should be driving home after a couple glasses of wine, and you're with somebody who hasn't drank as much as you, or is not buzzing like you are, whatever, with alcohol, um, and you want them to drive, that's a curb. Why? Because the fear of a DUI is a scary thing. You know, the fines are big, the, it goes on to your record, um, and it doesn't go off of your record, your insurance rates go up, so all of these things are, make us afraid to want to break the law. Now, that's what governments are supposed to do, is to put fear up there. And that's why we have police. That's why we have an IRS. That's why we have uh, government institutions, building codes. I was even in one when I was started out as a, what I it used to be called a weigher and sampler that I used to be in the milk business. And milk, you had to, uh, it, it, its value is in its butterfat content and it's in its solids nonfat. People understand butterfat more than solids nonfat, as well as its weight. So I had to be able to weigh with a dipper and put it into a little eight ounce bottle to have it sent off to a lab and I had to get a license just to do that. That's a curb. A license is a curb. The government is meant to work with fear in order to help us live together. It's not a perfect system. Now in democracy, fear can take all in a whole other uh, direction. Uh, Fear can be used to, in a sense, manipulate people. If you make people afraid, you can get them to do what you want. Now, Machiavelli, who is called the father of political science, said that in his book, The Prince, it's good as a prince to be loved by your people and to be feared by your people. But if you have a choice between those two, love and fear, take fear. Because fear is powerful. And fear is something that's given by God to curb sin. Now fear, as we say, can also be manipulated. Used to manipulate people. Richard Nixon made this statement. People respond more to fear than love. They don't teach this in Sunday school, but it's true. So if in a democracy, someone wants to be elected, they can exacerbate fear or put the worst construction on people's fears, build up people's fears to make them afraid to get the people to do what they want them to do, and that is vote for them. In the United States today, I think we're seeing something I haven't seen in my 60 years. We're seeing more conspiracy theories. That there's all these dark things going on, making people afraid, and people are feeding into those, and people's fears are causing them to take false things and put them out on the internet to make people afraid. This is very effective in a democracy because if you can make people afraid, you can get them to do what you want them to do. Now, what does this mean for a Christian? I would say that if Christianity, we are clinging to the things of this world, believing that this is where it's at, and by doing such thing, that makes us vulnerable. And if we're vulnerable, we become fearful. And if someone can manipulate us with our fears, they can get us to do some unscrupulous things, if we could use such a word. They can manipulate us and use us. But what does God say? God says he wants us to put us, our trust in him. There's a lot of people in the United States who believe that they have arrived at the truth. They understand. 
how a government is meant to work, even though we are a complex mixture of groups and individuals, and where do you put taxes, where do you give to people in a country, where do you not? Uh, this is a very difficult thing. There are people who believe, I've got the truth. And I'm very afraid, because if it's going away from the truth that I understand, or the truth that I have, bad things will happen. Easy to manipulate. God has the truth, if I just say it to you, if you haven't figured it out. We don't have the truth. No one's ever going to get the truth. There is no perfect governments. They're all messed up. They've always been messed up. And we're never going to fix them. We can approximate and fix them to a little extent, but they always will be flawed. Every political theory has flaws. The easy ones are to, uh, to spot are the ones of that other group rather than the group that I believe in. Don't be manipulated by fear. Love casts out fear. Fear is not God's will for your life. All right. What does God want to do? Point number three. God wants us to know conscience connects us with government. Okay. How else does God run the world? With curb? Through the conscience. If you go back to Romans 1, he will say that people know right from wrong because of what the, the law of God has been written on their hearts through conscience. Um, and I don't know about you, if you can feel it. Of course, I, yes, I can feel it in my life that conscience says to some people, don't do that. And they don't do it. I think it was like, was it Jiminy Cricket? They used to always say, uh, no, that was Pinocchio, maybe. Uh, always let your conscience be your guide. You know, we got Noah here. I don't know how many of these people Noah knows from way back. <laughs> um, that God has written on the conscience. But you know what? <laughs> I'm telling you all what you already know. Some consciences are messed up. You know, after World War II, when Auschwitz was taken back over by the Allied forces, they arrest the head of Auschwitz and all of these interview processes and the war trials and all that stuff that went on to, with the different people. But some of the people that were called in to do the investigation, put the court cases together, hear the evidence and all that, and interview the people that were head of the regimes or that were in charge of places like Auschwitz, they become fascinated. Because... They said that they looked at a, a German man who looks like he could live next door to you, who had a family with children and a spouse, and the atrocities that had taken place and the camp, uh, he feels absolutely no remorse for. And they were like, wow, how could this be? You got little kids, you know what terror means to little kids. You know what it's like to have somebody lose a family member because they've been murdered and they're innocent? It's terror of terrors in there. No, it's no. Conscience is not reliable. God speaks the word, but God also still at the same time speaks through conscience. He says, your conscience should tell you you have a government who are working for God and the world, we need to pay taxes to support them. How much taxes? Well, that's always open to problems and debates, isn't it? Those people in your life, some of people you owe honor. Your conscience tells you you need to honor them. Some people God has put into your life, you owe them respect. Your conscience needs to tell you to give them respect. And we will say, as Christians, we all fall short of the glory of God. And our consciences sometimes will convict us. But when they do, when they do, that 
It's the time when we go back by the power of the Holy Spirit to the cross, to God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness. I hope in this time that we've spent together here online, you grew an understanding a better way about why there's governments. Not just Canada, the United States, not just democracies, but governments throughout the world and how God uses them. But understand most of all, the kingdom of God is not of this world, and the kingdom of God is out there for anyone who's been loved and forgiven and who wants to respond. You've got a new king in your life, and it's not a president, and you don't vote for him, but that is Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and continue with the prayers. So let us pray for all the people of God according to God and his will. Dear Heavenly Father, you explain to us much of life today, the things of the world and why they're here, and they've always been here. Maybe there was a time when there wasn't government in this state of nature when we first came, humanity first came onto the earth. But Father, there's a purpose. So we ask that you would give wisdom, strong ethics, morality to all governments throughout the world. Not just Canada, not just the United States, not just Mexico, but for everywhere. That you would bless them with wisdom to do what is good and right, to be in harmony with your principles as you've shown them to be in nature of who we are as human beings. And dear Heavenly Father, as you've called us to come to you with cares and concerns and thanksgivings, we first come to you with a thanksgiving. We thank you for the life of John Dickerson, who had been a member of this church for so many years, um, a supporter uh, for the mission and ministry that you've given this congregation, faithfulness. We thank you for his life as he has passed away this week. Continue to bless his family with the comfort of the Holy Spirit and we say thank you for John, his love for Pat, his wife, for his children, for his community, for his church, and all that he has been for this world as a believer in you. And dear Heavenly Father, you ask us to come to you with cares and concerns of those who struggle. We think of all those who are struggling with COVID virus right now. Watch over them, Father. Take care of them. Provide for their needs. We pray for the scientists, for the lab workers who are looking for a vaccination. Lead them to the place that you know about, Father, and let this vaccination uh, come into the world to keep all of us safe um, and free us from the frustration that we have over COVID. And may we grow through this experience, uh, not just your people in the church, but nations throughout the world. And Heavenly Father, for Virginia Reinhardt, for Raymond Johnson, for Glenn Peterson, for Esther Alsep, for Kim Habakost, B. Iverson, M.J. Young, Floyd Krauss, Yvette Paul, Linda Glaze, and River Howell. Watch over them, take care of them as they struggle with health issues, and bless them and cure them if it's your will. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again. We thank you for people's lives. They wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And some are celebrating a birthday this week. I think Ruth Hagstrom today, uh, or on Sunday. Laurel I. Self, Slife, Dina Villavincencio, and Herb Hahn. Thank you for all of them, for creating them, for giving them another year. Thank you for those who celebrate anniversaries, Matthew and Susie D. Lamont, and Don and Charlotte Fraser. Thank you for bringing them together. Thank you for the love. That has given them one more year. Into your hands, Father, do we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Amen. It's offering time. I want to encourage you and remind you, please support your local church. If St. Matthew is your local church, we ask that you continue to support. Um, not because we say, but rather because God has first loved you. Uh, and that we need to give as God has given us. If this is not your church, please support your local church wherever it may be. 
um, for the sake of the mission of Christ and what God wants to do in your congregation. It's a response to his grace and his mercy, and it is a freedom to enjoy that we can find joy in giving. So let us pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May you walk on your journey through this life May God bless you on your journey. May you go with him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor, give you your life, his peace. Amen. God's blessings be with you all. I'd just like to introduce you to Noah here because we talk about him, but you don't see him. So Noah, just say hi to everybody. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I don't know if that picked up through the microphone or not. But uh, anyway, and we do uh, appreciate. And any comments down below, we appreciate. We'd love to get engaged with you wherever you may be. And uh, get your thoughts on some of these ideas that, or these thoughts that we're getting from Scripture and see what God has shown you through your life. But we want to say to you again, God's blessings be with all of you. Peace.